The Bolsheviks Come to Power by Alexander Rabinowitch Chapter 3 Petrograd During the Reaction The great contrast between the political atmosphere prevailing in Petrograd before the July crisis and the dominant mood in its aftermath was nowhere more evident than in an event, in an event of otherwise minor importance. The government-sponsored funeral of seven Cossacks killed fighting insurgents at the height of the July days. Saturday, July 15th was the day des designated by the provisional government to pay tribute to the slain Cossacks. Several days before, government officials, the Central Soviet organs, the Provisional Committee of the State Duma, and the Petrograd City Duma Municipal Council began working to stimulate public interest in the event. Viewed by its sponsors as yet another means of further discrediting the Bolsheviks and demonstrating support for law and order. On behalf of the city Duma, Grigory Schreider, the mayor of Petrograd, appealed to all those loyal to the revolution and all those infused with its spirit to pay homage to the fallen Cossacks. Meanwhile, in Central Executive Committee, sorry, meanwhile, the Central Executive Committee directed that every factory in the capital appoint a 30-man delegation to participate in the funeral. Fearing a, a repetition of the June 18th fiasco, the committee ordered workers not to carry banners or placards. To judge by press accounts of the funeral itself, efforts to mobilize a big crowd for the occasion were highly successful. Golos Soldata reported that by early morning, Nevsky Prospect had already taken on a very special appearance. Although few shops opened for business, people were everywhere about. The crowds were packed tightest in the area near St. Isaac's, Petrograd's largest cathedral, where the main services were to take place. Crowds also lined the route along which the cortege was to travel, from the cathedral to the Ex Alexander Nevsky Monastery, where the dead Cossacks were to be interred. Throughout the previous night, townspeople, along with relatives and friends of the slain Cossacks, had waited in long lines outside St. Isaac's for their turn to pay their last respects. Inside the vast candlelit cathedral, the dead Cossacks lay in state in open white ca caskets, while stern-faced Cossacks stood guard over their fallen comrades. Once admitted to the cathedral, many of the mourners remained there for the rest of the night, so that by early morning the church was filled to capacity and further entry was barred except to invited dignitaries. These began to arrive well before the requiem service was scheduled to start. Representatives of the various diplomatic missions in Russia, among them David Francis of the United States, Joseph Newlands of France, and George Buchanan of England, each accompanied by a military attaché and dress uniform, took their places alongside members of the Russian cabinet, the majority socialist leadership of the Soviet, officials of the Zemstvo and city administrations, representatives of the merchant and industrial estates, emissaries from each Cossack force in Russia and from every unit in the Petrograd garrison and delegations from major factories in the capital, as well as from a host of lesser groups and organizations. Shortly before 10 a.m., Kerensky appeared in the cathedral, reportedly looking pale and nervous. He was just then at a most difficult juncture in his efforts to form a government. He watched as the former court capella, the combined St. Isaac's and Kazan Cathedral choirs, and the personal choir of the Metropolitan filed to places reserved for them. The, ca the cathedral became hushed as the Archbishop of Petrograd, followed by the ex-arch of the Georgian Orthodox Church and the members of the Holy Synod ascended the platform before the altar to begin the requiem. At the start of the service, a procession of dignitaries laid wreaths of bright summer flowers at the foot of the caskets. Among the first to come forward was a delegation of Cossacks bearing a floral tribute inscribed to those who loyally did their duty and died at the hands of German agents. They were followed by the cadet leaders, Fedor Radichev, Pavel Milikov, and Vasily Maklikov, who carried a large wreath 
be ribboned in green and bearing the legend, to the loyal sons of free Russia who fell in struggle against traitors to their country. An approving observer from Zivoslovo reported that when the hundreds of voices of the combined choirs broke the silence to intone a solemn hymn, the entire congregation dropped to its knees. In this moving service, the prominent cadet Ariadna Turkova professed to have heard the voice of Russia itself. The requiem lasted nearly three hours. At its close, guards were placed and screwed down the casket lids. The caskets were then carried by selected high officials to the square outside the cathedral, where Cossack and Dragoon units, regiments of the Petrograd garrison, several military bands, and a detachment of trumpeters were massed for the procession to the Alexander Nevsky Monastery. As the first of the caskets, borne by cabinet ministers led by Kerensky, appeared from inside the cathedral, the commander of the Petrograd Military District ordered present arms. Regimental banners fluttered in a soft breeze from the Neva while a single trumpeter played taps. When the air was rent by the loud boom of ceremonial cannon at the Peter and Paul Fortress, the published sabers of the Cossacks gleamed in the bright sun, and at an officer's command, a forest of bayonets rose and sprang back in salute. Krensky stepped forward. Citizens, he thundered. Citizens, we are sharing a rare, sad historical moment. Every one of us must bow before the heroes who fell on the streets of the capital in the struggle for our homeland, for freedom, and for the honest name of a Russian citizen. On behalf of the government, I say to you that the Russian state is going through a terrible moment. It is closer to destruction than ever before in its history. Before all of you, I openly declare that all attempts to foment anarchy and disorder, regardless of where they come from, will be dealt with mercilessly. Before the bodies of the fallen, I beseech you to swear that along with us, you will work to save the state in freedom. Raising his right hand, Kerensky shouted, I pledge this. There was a brief silence, then thousands of hands shot into the air and a roar erupted from the crowd. We swear it. Those nearest Kerensky lifted him onto their shoulders and carried him to a waiting automobile. The cortege started forward. The bells of St. Isaac's tolled as the bands um, played the majestic anthem, How Glorious Is Our God in Zion. Leading the procession were the trumpeters, who were followed by a Cossack squadron carrying spikes or carrying pikes tied with black bunting. Priests in flowing black robes bearing tall crosses, church banners, and incense burners, several rows of choir boys, high dignitaries of the church, and the St. Isaac's and Metropolitan's choirs. The remains of the slain Cossacks were borne on Metropolitan's choir, oh, sorry, were borne on seven horse drawn gun carriages. A riderless horse ambled behind each of the first six carriages. Seated in the, sa in the saddle of the mount behind the last carriage was a thin-faced boy of about ten. The son of the slain Cossack, wearing the distinctive dark blue uniform trimmed with maroon of the Don Cossacks. Bringing up the rear of the long cortege were government and Soviet officials, followed by the delegations that had attended the ceremony and seemingly endless ranks of military troops. As the head of the procession turned from Morskaya Street into Nevsky Prospect, bells at several neighboring churches began to toll, adding their peals to those from St. Isaac's. When the procession reached the Kazan Cathedral itself, it halted for a brief service, a procedure that was repeated in front of the Znamensky Church. With these interruptions, the cortege did not reach its destination in Remarkably, the time passed without incident. Observers of the Cossack's funeral could not but have contrasted the occasion with the anti-government demonstrations of the preceding month. On July 15th, there were few workers to be seen, and as one reporter noted, the military bands did not play the Marseillaise once all the way to the cemetery. A commentator in REC on July 16th expressed great pleasure at what this outpouring of public sympathy for the slain Cossacks suggested about the apparent transformation in the popular mood. 
The days July 3rd to 5th had thrust all the stench stored up over many months into the streets and revealed in all its horror and, repul and repulsiveness where the unrestricted sway of insurgent lackeys and drunk helots led, he wrote. July 15th demonstrated what a healthy core had made its appearance. Once the logic of the revolution caused the shitty scum to be expelled. The Cossacks' funeral was thus both a sad and a joyous occasion. The writer in Rec concluded, sad for the losses mourned and joyous because Russia could now embark on a period of national rejuvenation. What was most astounding about the post-July days reaction in Petrograd was how quickly the prevailing political climate appeared to have shifted. One newspaper reporter observed at the time, the difference in mood between July 4th and 5th is so enormous. It is misleading to refer to it as a change. It is as if one had only been transported from one city to another and found oneself amidst different people in different moods. Many years later, the left Menshevik Vladimir Wojtynski remembered July 5th when the streets of Petrograd became the scene of a counter-revolutionary orgy and the debauchery of the Black Hundreds threatened to destroy the victory over the insurgents as one of the saddest days of his life. As early as July 6th, the All-Russian Executive Committees warned that the illegal arrests and the violent acts carried out in retaliation against the intimidation of July 3rd to 4th constituted a grave threat to the revolution, that is, to the, the repudiation of Tsarism and to the establishment of a permanent democratic political system. A session of the Petrograd City Duma on July 7th was continually interrupted by reports of trouble throughout the city. A Menshevik deputy declared, citizens who look like workers or who are suspected of being Bolsheviks are in constant danger of being beaten. Quite intelligent people are conducting ultra-anti-Semitic agitation, volunteered another deputy. Responding to such reports, the City Duma deputies agreed to prepare a public condemnation of street violence. Published the next day, the statement cautioned the public against falling prey to irresponsible agitators who, placing all the blame for the calamities being endured by the country on either the Jews, the bourgeoisie, or the workers, are instilling extremely dangerous thoughts in the minds of the aroused masses. In the Petrograd press of this period, there appeared a rash of reports regarding a sudden burst of activity on the part of extreme rightist groups. Among other organizations, apparently one of the most active was a group called Holy Russia, which according to a story in Izvestia, operated out of a bookstore on Pushkin Street. Holy Russia published its own page weekly news its own one page weekly newspaper, Grotza Thunderstorm, which heaped blame for all of Russia's ills on non-Russians, especially Jews, as well as on socialists, liberals, the bourgeoisie, and the proletariat. According to the Grotza, only Tsar Nicholas II was capable of furnishing bread and peace to the Russian people. Only he could save the country from total ruin. There were also frequent press reports of pogromist street agitation. Petrogradsky Listok, for example, carried an account of a street corner rally at which several speakers appealed to listeners to smash the Jews and the bourgeoisie because they are responsible for the murderous war. One speaker put particular emphasis on Jewish domination of the central organs of the Russian democracy. The assembled crowd would not disperse until broken up by a detachment of soldiers and militiamen. At about this time, several local Bolshevik party offices were raided and wrecked. During the afternoon of July 9th, for instance, soldiers raided party headquarters in the Litany district. The same evening, Bolshevik headquarters in the Petrograd district was attacked by 100 military school cadets arriving in four trucks and an armored car. Three party members in the headquarters were arrested and some money was seized by the cadets. Coming across the rubles, one of the cadets inquired incredulously, is this German money? Not only Jews and Bolsheviks, but also non-party labor organizations and Menshevik and SR groups felt the impact of this kind of, impact, of, this kind of action. 
thus the Trud Publishing House, which printed much trade union as well as exclusively Bolshevik material, was wrecked on July 5th. A few days later, the headquarters of the Metal Workers Union, the largest labor union in Russia, was also raided. A local Menshevik office that happened to adjoin the Bolshevik headquarters in the Petrograd district was wrecked when the latter was raided on July 9th. Office personnel had already left for the day. During these days, several moderate socialist officials were less successful in escaping blows aimed primarily at the Bolsheviks. Thus, a Trudovic representative on the Central Executive Committee was badly beaten and briefly jailed for publicly urging that people refrain from referring to Lenin as a spy until this case had been properly investigated. And on July 5th, Mark Liber, one of the most influential Mensheviks in the Soviet and an art critic of the Bolsheviks as well, was arrested by soldiers who mistook him for Zinoviev. During these same days, Yuri Steklov, a prominent radical social democrat with close ties to Bolshevik moderates, encountered such difficulties not once but three times. The night of July 7th, his apartment was raided by a detachment from the Petrograd military district. Steklov immediately phoned Kerensky, who arrived on the scene and persuaded the soldiers to leave Steklov alone. Later, however, a crowd of private citizens and soldiers, indignant that the first raiding party had come away empty-handed, gathered at Steklov's door, bent to unlynching him. Once more, Kerensky was summoned, and again he hurried over and freed Steklov, this time seeing to it that Steklov left the premises. Evidently, in part to avoid such harassment, Steklov left the capital the next afternoon for a few days at his summer home in Finland. Yet this proved no escape. Steklov's cottage neighbored that of Bonch Bruvich, where Lenin had been staying on the eve of the July days. During the night of July 10th, military cadets looking for Lenin and not finding him at Bonch Bruvich's moved on to search Steklov's home, grabbed Steklov and forced him to return to Petrograd. In reference to such incidents, the Iz Izvestia of the Moscow Soviet commented ruefully, the cadets are not very knowledgeable about our differences. On July 18th, the, the Provisional Committee of the Duma held a sensational, widely publicized meeting, yet another barometer of the times. During the February days, deputies to the State Duma had created the Provisional Committee to help restore order. Along with the Executive Committee of the Petrograd Soviet, this committee, um, this committee had played a prominent role in the formation of the first provisional government. Subsequently, relatively little was heard from the provisional committee. Its 50 or 60 active members, headed by Mikhail Rodzienko, seemed content to hold periodic unofficial discussions of governmental problems and with less frequency to issue pronouncements on political questions about which they felt strongly. During the early summer, however, as liberal and conservative members of the committee reacted to attacks, of, attacks from the left and to the government's obvious incapacity to deal with outstanding problems, the committee's meetings and pronouncements became increasingly militant. In the wake of developments in June and July, more than a few deputies became convinced that the Duma's complicity in the overthrow of the old regime had been a tragic error and that the Russian state was on the brink of destruction. Quite a number of deputies now also came to believe that the Duma, Russia's sole legally elected representative body, was duty-bound to try to save the country by helping to create a powerful government free of leftist influence. This view was forcefully expressed on July 18th at a meeting of the Provisional Committee convened to formulate a public declaration on the existing political situation and, more fundamentally, to discuss the Duma's course of action. At this meeting, the two rightist deputies, A.M. Maslen Maslenikov and Vladimir Perchkevich, the latter best known for his involvement in the assassination of Rasputin, went furthest in attacking the prevailing situation. Ms. Lenikov placed most of the blame for the tragedies befalling Russia on the leaders of the Soviet, whom he called dreamers, 
lunatics passing themselves off as pacifists, petty careerists, and a group of fanatics, transients, and traitors. Mislenikov implied that those involved were mostly Jews, and he made no distinction between moderate socialists and Bolsheviks. To the approval of many deputies, he proposed that the full Duma be convened in official session and demanded that all cabinet members report to it for a complete accounting. The Duma could then determine how the government should be reconstructed and what policies it should follow. The state Duma is a trench defending the honor, the, uh, the dignity and the existence of Russia, he concluded. In this trench, we will either win or die. Per Perishkovich voiced complete agreement with Maslenikov and expressed particular bitterness towards all those who continue to concern themselves with the defense of the revolution at a time when, in his words, every patriot ought to be shouting from every rooftop. Save Russia, save the motherland. She is poised on the edge of ruin, more because of internal enemies than because of the foreign foe. According to Perish Perishkovich, what the country needed most was a strong voice to sound the alarm about the misfortunes befalling Russia, as well as liberal use of the noose. If a thousand, two thousand, perhaps five thousand scoundrels at the front and several dozen in the rear had been done away with, he declared, we would not have suffered such an unprecedented disgrace. To restrict hanging to the front, he contended referring to the reimposition of the death penalty there made no sense at all. Rather, it is necessary to eradicate the sources of trouble, not merely its consequences. Like, like Maslenikov, Purishkevich viewed the activity of the Soviet as wholly pernicious and looked to the Duma to speak out sternly and powerfully and to met out proper punishment to all who had earned it. Long live the state Duma, shouted Purishkevich, emotionally toward the end of his speech. It is the only organ capable of saving Russia, and let all the sinister forces that cling to the provisional government be destroyed. These forces are led by people who have nothing in common with the peasantry, the soldiers or the workers, and who fish in troubled waters alongside provocateurs maintained by the German emperor. Um, despite the strong rhetoric, by Mislenikov and Perishkovich, the public appeal for firm government, free Soviet influence, and for total commitment to the war effort that the Provisional Committee subsequently adopted was moderate in tone. Moreover, the committee rejected the notion of, of attempting to convene the full Duma to met out punishment. A majority of the deputies apparently agreed with Molkov's conclusion that such a step was inappropriate. Nonetheless, for the left, and especially for the Bolsheviks, these were indeed difficult days. Subsequently remembered by many revolutionary veterans as perhaps the roughest in the history of the party. In some early memoirs of this period, Alexander Ilin Zanevsky, an editor of Soldatskaya Pravda, recorded the problems he encountered searching for a press willing to print Bolshevik publications. Sent away with insults wherever he went, often even before identifying himself, he recalled wondering whether one could tell a Bolshevik by his looks. The Kronstadt Bolshevik Ivan Florovsky described a walk that he and Lunikarsky had taken together on July 5th. On Nevsky Prospect, just below the Anichkov Bridge, Florovsky was grabbed by a fellow wearing a cross of St. George in his, lap in his lapel, who was screaming, Here they are, anarchists. This one is from Kronstadt. A hostile mob at once surrounded Florovsky and Lunikarsky and dragged them off to General Staff Headquarters. In his memoirs, Florovsky relates in some detail the harrowing moments that ensued. The square separating the headquarters from the Winter Palace was in use at the time as a staging and billeting area for military forces mobilized by the government to restore order. It was crammed with pup tents, machine guns, artillery pieces, and stacked rifles. 
As Florovsky and Lunikarsky were led through the area, crowds of milling, restless soldiers shook their fists menacingly and shouted obscenities at the pair of German agents. Bolshevik newspapers of the post-July days period contain numerous accounts of the indignities suffered by suspected leftists. On July 14th, for example, Prolet Proletarsko Dello printed an anguished letter from two imprisoned sailors, Aleko Fadiv and Mikhail Mik Mikhailov. On July 7th at 9 a.m., we set out to return to our units in Kronstadt when we were suddenly apprehended by a detachment of cadets and taken to general staff headquarters. While we were being led through the streets, the intelligentsia pounced on us, determined to kill us. Some of the attacker attackers said scandalous things about us, that we were German agents. When we passed the naval staff building, even, even the... Even the doorman there begged our guard to line up or line us up on the bank and shoot us. Just as we arrived at headquarters, another convoy drew up with 10 people under arrest. All had been beaten up and blood was streaming from their faces. Many of those detained in this way were questioned and soon released. Some, however, spent weeks and even months in prison. Trotsky, who was imprisoned in the crosses, described his encounters with some of these prisoners. One worker, Anton Ivashin, was beaten up and arrested in a public bath. Ivashin came to grief when, overhearing some dragoons newly arrived from the front, talking about how the Petrograd garrison was receiving money from the Germans, he interrupted his scrubbing to inquire whether the soldiers had actually seen any evidence. He was immediately hauled off to jail. Another of Trotsky's fellow prisoners, Ivan Piskunov, was arrested for an equally careless remark. Chancing to come upon a street rally and hearing a soldier affirm that 6,000 rubles had been found in the pockets of a rebel soldier killed in the July days, he barely managed to blurt, that can't be, before he was pummeled and dragged away. While there were frequent incidents of this kind during the post-July days reaction, what seems most remarkable is that only one Bolshevik, Ivan Voinov, a 23-year-old helper in the Pravda circulation room, was killed. On July 6th, Voinov was arrested while distributing copies of Listok Pravdi. While he was being transported for interrogation, one of his captors struck him in the head with a saber. The young Bolshevik died instantly. It is difficult to estimate the number of Bolsheviks incarcerated in the aftermath of the July uprising in part because many of those arrested were soon released and hence are not counted in available published sources, and also because political prisoners were held in many places of detention scattered throughout the capital. Roughly 30, po uh, roughly 30 politicals, among them Peter Dash Dashkevich, Nikolai Krylenko, I.U. Kudelko, Mikhail Tur Arutunians, Oswald Zenis, Nikolai Vishnevitsky, and Yuri Kotsibinsky, all military officers in the Krema Military Organization unit level garrison leadership, were held in the first district militia headquarters. Alan Zanevsky, who often passed the building, later recalled seeing the familiar faces of his former close associates peering through the barred windows of their cells. Catching sight of him, they would smile and wave. About 100. About 150 prisoners, a large percentage of them Kronstadt sailors, indis indiscriminately rounded up in the streets, were held in the 2nd District Militia Headquarters. The crosses held 131 politicals, many of whom were suspected extreme leftists, netted in the streets, often merely for a loose word. In the crosses, too, were some of the government's most prized prisoners, including Trotsky, Kamenev, Lunikarsky, Raskolnikov, Vasily Sekhrov, Roshel, Remnev, and Kostov, some of the soldiers of the 1st Machine Gun Regiment who had initially triggered the July days, and Antonov, Osinko, Debenko, and Kovrin of Centrobalt. Female prisoners, including the notorious Kalantai, 
were jailed in the Vyberg district, hard labor prison for women. Twenty Bolsheviks were kept in the transfer prison, and over a dozen party members, presumably those requiring medical treatment, were held in the Nikolevsky Military Hospital. The regime in these places of detention varied considerably. Nonetheless, except perhaps for the food, conditions in all of them were a good deal less oppressive than in Tsarist days. While the staff in most prisons included a significant percentage of holdovers from before the February Revolution, even these veterans now tended to be relatively lenient. Raskolnikov recalled that many of his guards at the crosses were cautious toward, indeed even fearful of, politicals. After all, following the February Revolution, yesterday's high officials suddenly turned up in jail, while some of the previous inmates instantly became cabinet ministers. Prison personnel were naturally wary of such a turnabout happening again. Bolsheviks in common cells holding several inmates were also relatively well off. The prisoners who suffered most in the aftermath of the July days were those held in the 2nd District Militia Headquarters, where overcrowding was a problem, and those particularly notorious figures, among them Raskolnikov, Trotsky, Kamenev, and Lunikarsky, who were initially kept in solitary confinement, confinement in the crosses. Treatment of the imprisoned Bolsheviks shifted from the prevailing political winds. Thus, the going was roughest for politicals just after the July days, when the provisional government appeared potentially strong, and when it seemed as if the Bolsheviks were permanently crushed. When the fortunes of the party began to recover, the prison regime became noticeably freer. After a few weeks, Raskolnikov, for one, was removed from solitary confinement and was amazed to find that the doors to cells and the crosses were now kept open throughout the day. By the beginning of this open-door policy, he wrote, individual cells were transformed into Jacobin clubs. Moving from one cell to another in noisy groups, we argued, played chess, and shared what we read in the newspapers. Recalling significant differences of opinion among his fellow prisoners, Raskolnikov observed that while all prisoners had faith in the ultimate triumph of the proletariat, in contrast to pre-revolutionary days, when political prisoners were, typically, ideologically well-grounded professional revolutionaries, a significant number of his comrades in the crosses were youthful, recent converts to the Bolshevik cause. As a consequence, there were frequent, fierce debates about revolutionary tactics between impatient hotheads who believed the party had made a grievous error in not trying to take power in July. And older, experienced, more disciplined Bolsheviks who defended the tactics of the Central Committee. When, when Raskolnikov insisted that power could not be seized until a majority of workers supported the Bolsheviks, the hotheads countered that an energetic revolutionary vanguard could seize power on its own in the interest of the working class. Raskolnikov adds that while Trotsky had fully supported the cautious policy of the Central Committee during the July days, now sitting in jail, he occasionally had second thoughts. Perhaps we should have given it a try. What if the front had supported us? Then everything would have turned out differently. But these impetuous thoughts inevitably gave way very quickly to a more logical analysis of the prevailing correlation of forces. Almost all jailed rebels were allowed writing materials and many took advantage of lax security to send petitions, articles, and messages to the world outside. Some prisoners, Rochel for one, used this time to begin writing memoirs. Among the inmates of the crosses, the most prolific author appears to have been Trotsky. Taking time out only for daily walks, he remained rooted in his desk or rooted to his desk, writing political pamphlets and preparing daily articles for the Bolshevik press. A week after his arrest, Kamenev drew up a personal appeal to the Central Executive Committee for help in expediting the proceedings against him. I turned myself over, over to the courts because I had faith that the authorities would present the accusations against me without delay and that I would have full opportunity to explain myself. Instead, a whole week has gone by and I still have not seen a single representative of the court authorities. Meanwhile, my being locked up has deprived me of the ability to wage a public struggle against the vile slander concerning my connection with German money. I 
I want to think that the Soviet will not force me to acknowledge that those of my comrades who failed to obey its directives to submit to the authorities acted more wisely than I. Somewhat later, a group of political prisoners identifying themselves only as soldiers thrown into prison formulated an appeal to comrades cyclists and soldiers of other military units that have arrived from the front. You, dear comrades, know that our comrade workers and soldiers have been in Petrograd prisons without trials for more than a month. Do you know that many of our comrade soldiers and workers are charged with being traitors merely because they had the courage to call themselves Bolsheviks? It is painful for us if you are aware of this and remain silent, but we do not believe this to be the case. We believe you are already on our side, that you sympathize with us and that you will come to help us. There is no record of any response to such appeals. Naturally, Bolsheviks who still had their freedom did what they could to help arrest, to help arrested comrades, mobilizing public concern for their plight and maintaining the strongest possible pressure upon the government to release them. The Bolshevik Petersburg Committee created a special organization, the Proletarian Red Cross, to, to collect funds for prisoners and their families. Mutual aid organizations were also established at the district level. After, after several weeks of detention and increasing signs of a possible rightist coup, the patience of some prisoners reached the breaking point, despite improving conditions of confinement. What appears to have oppressed prisoners most was the government's resultariness in handling their cases, in particular in questioning and formally in, indicting them. Condemnation as German agents also enraged each and every prisoner including the usually very controlled Trotsky. Within our stone cells, this slander pressed in on us like a wave of suffocating gas, one prisoner subsequently related. The inmates' growing frustration was reflected in their increasingly bitter letters and declarations. I lost my place. Which appeared prominently in the leftist press. Um, on August 2nd, political prisoners in the 2nd District Militia Headquarters hit on a new way to protest their treatment, declaring a hunger strike. This action ended three days later, after representatives of the Central Executive Committee guaranteed that the prisoners' cases would be attended to without further delay, and that individuals against whom there were no specific charges would soon be released. Beginning in mid-August, inmates at the 2nd District Militia Headquarters were gradually freed, and in due course this success stimulated a wave of hunger strikes at other prisons. In time, these protests would arouse the sympathy of a major segment of the Petrograd population. For the moment, however, only a very, very small percentage of jailed Bolsheviks were actually set free.